Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, an update on a major lawsuit over inflation adjustments for public schools. Also tonight, the latest from the state capitol in our weekly legislative update. And gas prices are low. How long will they stay that way? Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A major lawsuit over inflation adjustments to state spending for public schools is still on hold after a judge backed off her original order to start negotiations and instead recommended that lawmakers and school officials work out a deal. Here to help sort all of this out is Chuck Essigs, the Director of Governmental Affairs for the Arizona Association of School Business Officials. And we should note we had uh, the Speaker of the House and the Senate President on last night for their side. They couldn't say much because they didn't want to comment before reading the decision. You, of course, are on the other side of this issue. Let's get started. Judge suggests a lawsuit settlement. Uh, what's going on here? Well, the judge is suggesting that the parties meet and kind of work, work out a solution, that it would be a lot better than her having to issue a ruling, a final ruling. She's already made a couple of rulings, and and uh, so it's a suggestion. The, the school districts and the charter sc traditional school districts and charter schools that are part of the lawsuit have already agreed that they would like to work on a settlement, and now the judge would be waiting for the state to decide if they want to participate. Why do you think she didn't just go ahead and order a settlement? I think there was some question about whether she could do that. In turn, you know, certainly she can make rulings, but the question is, could she require a state agency to? actually participate. Will and should schools participate? Definitely. We, we want to settle this. It's gone on way too long. For example, we have now all the students who are currently in high school, the students who graduated last year, were never in a high school classroom that was fully funded. The students in elementary school now, they're up, to, and this is the School Boards Association, I thought, put this together very well. They're all the way up to fifth grade without being in a class, classroom that's been fully funded. So we need to Get, get this behind us and move forward. I know one of the attorneys on the school side said that the negotiations, if, if they take part in these negotiations, they must be done in, quote, good faith. What does that mean? Um, oh, I know what good faith on our end is, is to sit down and, and really work together. Just, just as if, if you and I were involved in a lawsuit, each of us working in good faith means we really want to solve the problem. Let's get back for those who aren't completely up to speed on this. And this is at once it's very simple, but it's also very complicated. What does the lawsuit deal with? Back in 1980, when the voters of this state approved Proposition 301, they included in there an inflation adjustment that the legislature each year should adjust the funding formula to schools to keep pace with inflation up to 2%. If inflation's more than 2%, then the maximum increase is 2%. And that was to happen every year going forward. Uh, in the 90s, schools lost a lot of ground to inflation. And the legislature did that for a number of years, fully funded the inflation uh, that was provided by the voters in Prop 301, and then in 2009, 2010, when the, the economy went bad, they tried to only take a small portion of the school funding formula and say, we'll, we'll just provide an inflation adjustment for that, and that meets the requirements of the voters. I think the state said that they, they had gone ahead and funded more than inflation adjustments earlier, so that explained why they could do less later. Uh, but that's um, that's not what Prop 301 says. The Prop 301 says you take the funding from the prior year and you increase it for inflation. If you don't do that, you lose to inflation. Your, your inflation is going to eat into the dollars that you have available. I know semantics are playing a big part in this, as it often does, as they often do, uh, in terms of the law. But it sounds that the proposition reads to increase the base level, as you said, or other components of the revenue control limit. And what the legislature is saying or means either the base level or other components, and they have funded those other components. Make sense? But that's not what it says. The, the Attorney General, when Janet Napolitano was Attorney General, she ruled that you have to take it together, and now different levels of the courts, including the Supreme Court, where the, it's gone all the way through, basically have said, no, you've got to look at it in total, you just can't. Or actually means you look at both of those components and adjust the whole formula for inflation. So when the state says that we increase transportation funding, that's a component, that's an or, you're saying? That, that was the basis for this lawsuit and the courts have ruled in the favor of school districts. So um, the schools, 
how much money are we talking about? Again, let's get back to the basics here. What are we talking about? Because I know there's, there's a back payment issue here that is almost exponentially more than the original matter. Right. First thing, going forward, it's about $300 million, $320 million a year. And the, the thing that's critical is this goes on, the, the voters didn't put a timeline on this. This goes on for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So if we don't do it right this year, it's going to affect school funding for every year in the future until the voters change that provision. And just to, to show how, how, what the magnitude of it is, if you just go back to the years they haven't done it in the past since 2009-2010 school year, that's over a billion dollars that schools were shorted. Uh, and that's what the state would owe districts if, if the court actually continues with the ruling if you've got to make those back payments. Now, originally we had heard that there was some sort of offer from schools on the table, something along the lines of a billion dollars or cutting that, uh, getting rid of the back payment and just going straight forward with the base amount uh, as it is. Uh, is that, is that, first of all, is that accurate? And secondly, is it still on the table? Uh, back in October, the schools made that offer and the state never really responded. But basically, what it, it was so important to get this right going forward is that the uh, school people said, do it right starting now and going forward and, and we'll forgive you and not require those back payments to be made. And that was $1.3 billion, it was estimated. How, where did that offer go? Uh, nowhere. Uh, it's just kind of laid around and took a nap or something and didn't okay. go anywhere. Well, with that in mind, then, is that kind of an offer still on the table? I think schools are, are, are so uh, anxious to get this thing right and get it moving forward and get the money into the schools that I think they, ought, they would still continue that offer is to waive the back payments. And the other important thing, this affects a lot of kids in the state because it's all of the traditional school districts and all of the traditional ch and all the charter schools are part of this lawsuit now. What about interest on that amount that is owed? What happens to that? Uh, that's never been brought up. Uh, you know, it, it was kind of, they looked at what would, would have been paid had it been paid properly, and I don't think interest had ever gotten into this debate. Will it get into this debate? Uh, well, ho hopefully it won't, because hopefully the state will work out a settlement that schools find acceptable, we're okay going forward, and we would waive those ba that billion dollars of back payments. If I'm from the legislature and I say, all right, here's the deal, uh, we, we did spend more than required earlier. Um, we don't have the money now, and we didn't have the money back when we started easing off on this thing. Let's just take it, uh, give us the credit, and we'll get it down from 317 or 320 million. It knocks it down to 80 million, and we'll go from there. Is that something the schools would consider? Uh, I don't believe so. Because? Because the court's already ruled that that's, you can't do that. You well, have to take the base level from the prior year. If you put extra money in in the prior year, that's great. But if you don't keep adjusting that if, as you move forward in inflation, that money will just be eaten up by inflation. So schools are pretty adamant that we need to have the formula as it was written and as the courts have approved it, uh, that it, it's take prior year inflation and fund it going forward. How adamant are schools? How far are schools prepared to go on this? Um, it's, it's hard to I think as far as it needs to, to get this thing settled and get it moving forward. But the important thing is this is not a one-year decision. If we don't do it right today, it's going to affect schools for 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road because it, it builds off of where we are today. I was going to say, last question here. You've been quoted as saying this is one of the biggest legal decisions in Arizona education history. Is that why? Yeah, yeah. The down the road it, it, aspect? Because it it's really simple. You go back and look the last couple of years that they didn't do it. It was a billion dollars. We'll figure out it, how many billions of dollars that will be if we don't get it right and, and settle at the right number so going the forward. So the judge is recommending you guys get back together. Uh, is, she, is she setting any, another deadline? I know she wants it by the end of the week. Is that a firm deadline? Is that what, what's it? What's I, I, it's kind of, I think, what she's basically saying, I need an answer by the end of the week. Schools have already agreed that they want to uh, negotiate this and want to get it settled. Uh, I think she's just waiting for the state to make a decision. We really appreciate Governor Ducey very strongly said, get this thing settled. Because um, why, you know, he, he said pay teachers instead of attorneys or whatever, but why keep going on? We know what the issues are. The courts have already ruled on it. Let's get it settled and move forward. All right, Chuck, thanks for joining us. We mentioned again that we had uh, leadership, uh, the uh, legislative leadership on last night to talk about this. Uh, they didn't want to go too far in it because the decision, they had not read it as yet. I'm sure we will find out uh, their reaction here shortly. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here.
Each week during the legislative session, we team with the Arizona Capital Times for an update of what state lawmakers are debating and considering. And here to kick off our coverage of the 2015 session is Arizona Capital Times reporter Ben Giles. Good to see you again. Thank you. All right, let's get it going here with something that literally just happened today, this afternoon. Looks like we got a high school civics test ready to be signed into law. Yeah, a new high stakes test, a new graduation requirement for high schoolers. Um, they'll be able to take it as, as many times as necessary, lawmakers say, but they will have to pass the citizenship test that is uh, issued by immigration services. Uh, there's 100 questions and the bill states that you have to answer 60 of those correctly to graduate. And you start in the eighth grade and if it takes you 47,000 times to do it, you get all of them. You know, there's not actually a lot of detail in the bill about how the test is going to be administered, and, and that is one of the complaints from the schools, from teachers unions, that this is an unfunded mandate that uh, they claim the lawmakers don't understand, that there is going to be a cost to this, whereas the lawmakers were arguing these are things that students should already be learning, that they should already know. Um, it should be an easy test to pass, so why should it be so difficult? Why should it be so costly to administer? I would imagine that the 60 out of 100 questions, that does seem to be uh, not the sturdiest of requirements here. And if you can retake the test year after year, uh, that seemed to be, uh, I would think you'd be able to fold those into your regular civics studies, wouldn't you? It, it is a pretty low threshold as far as, you know, a passing grade for a test goes. Um, I think the point that a lot of uh, teachers made in, in committee hearings, this was rushed through the Capitol today in committees in the House and Senate and then on the floor of each chamber, was that because it's so easy to pass, because we're already teaching it, why are we wasting this classroom time to assess it? Uh, it, it was almost as if some of the teachers were, were offended by the idea that this needs to be tested. And some even made the point, and, and a lot of Democrats on the floor made the point, that this is a regressive test, that just this rote memorization of facts about American history is actually regressive from the types of civic lessons that uh, teachers are trying to impart on their students now, which is more of a, a critical thinking mindset about how government works. Is this as much about the legislature showing Governor Ducey that they can work together? This is fast track. The governor called for this in a state of the state address. Uh, they got it done pronto. Is this kind of a goodwill gesture to open things up here? I, I think in a way, yes, and it is a part of a larger national push. Arizona is not the only state that's considering passing uh, a high-stakes civics test as, as a graduation requirement. Um, but certainly, I, I think both uh, the governor's office and Republicans at the legislature wanted to show they can work together, they can agree on things, and, and they certainly did that today. And, and there was bipartisan support for some, from some for the bills. There were Democrats who, who voted for this test. So we're the first state, as soon as the governor signs it, the first state in the union for that. Um, there's a proposal to change the Voter Protection Act out there. This is not the first time we've heard of something like this. But uh, talk to us about what this means and what it would mean as far as initiatives that folks vote on. Well, the resolution hasn't been introduced yet, but Representative J.D. Mesnard has said that he'd like to change the, the requirement for what triggers the Voter Protection Act, which was approved by voters in 1998, as a direct result of uh, the legislature uh, the year before overturning the first time Arizona passed medicinal marijuana. In 1996, with 65 percent of the vote, they approved it. In 1997, the lawmakers came back and said, we think that was a misinformation campaign. We don't think it's the right thing to do. They repealed it. So what the, what the people said was, we want to protect these initiatives, these ballots, these statutory ballot measures. Um, so now the lawmakers have to, if they want to change those laws approved by voters, uh, overwhelmingly vote to support to change it and only vote to support to change it in a way that furthers the intent of the bill. They can't really change it virtually is the argument. So this idea is what? Simple majority? Uh, or well, well, right now, those protections that I just described, those are triggered by a simple majority vote of the people. What Mesnard's proposal would do is require a two-thirds majority vote of the people to trigger those, cha those, those protections. Now, a simple majority would still approve the statutory change that voters are, are voting on, but that means that lawmakers in the very next year could come back and change right. it or repeal it if they chose. So a simple majority means it passes, but it's still uh, available to be messed around with by the lawmakers. Two-thirds majority means you can't touch it the way it is right now. Ironically, this idea 
has to go back to voters, does it, it does. not? It's a constitutional amendment, which is why uh, a resolution has to be introduced to send it back to the ballot. So uh, if, you want to, if you want to basically lessen the number of instances in which voter protections would occur, you have to convince the voters that that's a good idea, and you have to get a popular vote to approve it. So is it, is it likely at all that voters will weaken a protection that they have in this process? You know, folks who, who push citizens' initiatives, uh, environmental groups, certainly the, uh, the, the lobby to, to legalize marijuana, which is going to be a big push in 2016, they say no. They say that, that this is not going to be an easy sell, and, and they can't imagine that the voters would want to, to weaken an authority that they have. Um, which basically, uh, they argue, is born out of an idea that the legislature isn't always reflective of the majority of the people. Last question before you go. I know that there's an idea as well to keep candidate addresses secret. What's that all about? Um, not just candidates, but also if you win, uh, you would continue to be have your address be kept secret. City if you lawmakers were, as well. Uh, lawmakers, really any statewide publicly elected office this would apply to. Um, uh, the idea of being born out of a, a privacy concern and, and possibly a, a public safety concern, uh, Representative Kelly Townsend expressed that um, she has at times felt you know, threatened by maybe strangers being on her property or placing things near her home. There were instances during the campaign season where um, uh, nasty notes were posted on signs near lawmakers' homes. Um, so th they're worried that people know where they live. Yeah, but they're worried, and yet, how are you going to, I mean, if these addresses are secret, how do folks know if the people are in their proper district? How do they know if they haven't moved around? I mean, and that, and that is the issue because uh, the idea is if, if you want to make sure that you're being represented properly, uh, or specifically, if you want to make sure you're being represented by someone who lives in your district, who lives in your neighborhood, um, you can, via public records request, go to the Secretary of State's office and, and find out where they live and, and see mm -hmm. if they truly do live there. And that has been an issue that's popped up numerous times in the last three years or so where lawmakers' residency has been challenged. So it's, it's not something that uh, is uncommon for, for, for someone to question whether or not a lawmaker actually lives in the district they claim to represent, which they're constitutionally required to do so. So uh, how likely is something like this if it gets far how far does it go? You know, it's hard to say. Uh, we, we've heard from um, certainly folks who have been a part of these former legal challenges that, no, this, this, this doesn't stand a chance. And there was even a former state senator, Ron Gould, who said this is almost a, an unrepublican thing to, to propose, that you're supposed to be sending your neighbors to represent you, and, and wouldn't it be nice to know where your neighbor lived? Or, or even the fact that as a lawmaker or as an elected official, you should be out amongst your people. It's not that hard to find you anyway. Oh, why, why should your home be, be kept private? All right, we'll keep an eye on that one. Uh, ben, good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Gas prices in Arizona are lower than they've been in years, but how long can they stay this low and how are prices at the pumps impacting summer travel forecasts? Joining us now is Linda Gorman, Communications and Public Affairs Director at AAA Arizona. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. Uh, what is the average gas price in Phoenix right now? Well, as of today, we have finally dipped below $2 a gallon, so we're at $1.98, and we have not been here since May of 2009. So it's, it's prices have fallen, and they've fallen 
happened very quickly, in fact. Why? What's going on? Well, the big story is oil prices. So oil prices started their plunge in the summer, and they have not looked back. Um, in fact, they've lost about half of their value since the summer. And um, today we saw a little bit of activity, but prices still continue to trade historically low. Is it uh, oversupply? Is it lack of demand? A little bit of both? What's happening out there? Uh, a little bit of both. There's plenty of supply out there. And, what, and really what's <laughs> happened is the reason why it stayed low for so long is OPEC, who they meet regularly to discuss whether or not they're going to intervene in supply production. In the past, whenever you see prices start to fall, OPEC has a meeting and they, they tend to make an adjustment in the supply de, um, production and then you'll see prices uh, turn around. That has not been the case. They have said continuously and have um, negle ne neglected to intervene on several occasions and have said that they believe that the market is fine and they will not intervene. So is, is there any thought that oil companies are about to cut back production? Any oil company anywhere? Well, you know, the the other part of the story is that domestic production, so, and, th and this is a theory as to perhaps why OPEC isn't isn't deciding to, to intervene, is that oil production in the United Sp States especially is very expensive to produce. So we are seeing uh, domestic oil producers, they're losing money and they may have to force uh, cutting jobs. And so is this another way to control the market? Because if you get rid of, if competitors can no longer produce oil, maybe they will no longer be competitors. Basically, OPEC trying to squeeze out the other guys. Mm -hmm. Poss Inter possibly. Uh -huh. Possibly, yes, I know the theory there. <laughs> Is there are, are there triggers? Is it like a $30 a barrel? Is that, did I read that there are actually triggers out there in which they will start cutting back? There have been in the past. Um, you know, it, it all depends on. I mean, we've saw oil prices above a hundred dollars a barrel, and no, you know, people didn't think that they would get that high. But in the past, it's been fifty. A thirty has been a trigger. I read something today where s there was a, a speculator saying it could go as low as twenty. If that's the case, um, good news for motorists, but it's it really does have some unintended consequences or consequences that people don't think about. I want to get to those consequences in mm -hmm. a second. But what about diesel prices? What are we seeing there? Diesel prices are also low. Um, and, and gas prices are low across the board, in fact, and as are price, diesel prices, which also impact airfares. However, airfares aren't necessarily falling. There are a lot of other factors at play, but there are prices all across the board right now, nationwide and in, and in Arizona, about half of the states are below $2 a gallon. So it's really interesting that we're talking about $2 a gallon yes. right now. Yes, it's mm -hmm. actually kind of surreal. Uh, but right. And you talked about mm -hmm. some of the unintended consequences. Let's talk about those in the gas and oil industry. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy who runs the corner pump station, I don't know if there mm -hmm. is any of those guys left anymore. They not, seem to be all major not operators. Not too much, right. Uh, how is this all hitting them? Well, you know, a lot of people tend to think when gas, is pr gas prices rise that that company or that independent owner is making a lot of money. And in fact, that is just not the case. And especially now with um, all of the, the mergers and um, the very few companies that are actually in the business anymore of supplying gasoline, that it's ra very rarely are those companies making a lot of profit. Um, you know, margins do fluctuate, but typically not by a lot, and they don't stay that way for very long. It's a volatile, it's a volatile market, oil and, and gasoline, and it always has been, and it always will be until until there's a replacement found but um, you know they're not making a lot they're not the ones that are making a lot of money when the prices go up and as the prices go down they're not making much mm -hmm. money either so you mentioned mm -hmm. volatility let's talk about a forecaster I know mm -hmm. summer travel seasons are just around the corner in spring it seems like prices usually tick up a little bit in the spring anyway mm -hmm. what are you seeing as far as the rest of the year they, they do yeah we're predicting actually prices are going to stay certainly well below th uh, three dollars for 2015 it'll it'll well, it's too soon to tell how if they'll stay below two dollars for very long. But prices typically tend to tip, tick up around February, where um, refineries go into their maintenance season. It doesn't impact impact us as much as it used to in Arizona um, because we've got two uh, distribution lines to pull mm -hmm. from. And then summer you'll typically see an increase and then it'll fall a little bit and then an increase again in hurricane season. But I tell you, the last six months have just really defied history in terms of uh, when we typically see increases. Well, all right, let's see how it goes. Until then, I guess fill her up, huh? <laughs> if, you, if you can <laughs> if, store it, right? Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Good to see you again. <laughs> nice Thanks for to joining see you too. Mm -hmm. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists Roundtable. The governor is set to release his much-anticipated budget plan, and we'll have more on that lawsuit over inflation adjustments for state funding of public schools. That's Friday on the Journalists Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. 
You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.